Hi, my name is Janine Nodder. I'm a New Hampshire State Representative and the host of Chatting with Janine. It's a variety show that's been on the air since 2006. Normally we tape in the studio three miles up the road, but quarantine halted production until Merrimack TV came to the rescue with Zoom. In addition to my regular shows, sometimes I take specials. This will be my first virtual Chatting with Janine Presents, and the topic is the Cap Marines. I welcome the Cap Marines who will be watching this episode, and I thank you all for your service. Samper Fi. And my guest is my favorite historian slash Marine, Lee Rash, who's in his home office in California, and he also happens to be my brother. Hey, Lee, hey, Lee how are you? Hi, real good. Thank you. So the Cap Marines, I, I'm going to just assume that doesn't stand for Civil Air Patrol. Definitely not. Okay. Well, what does it stand for? It stands for Combined Action Program. And I'm going to give you a little explanation about how that came about and what that means as we proceed. Okay. You may proceed. All right. Let's proceed. Okay, <clears throat> this first picture that I have here for you is pretty much what I think about when I think of Vietnam. The Cap Marines actually lived out in the villages with the Vietnamese people during the Vietnam War. And in every village that we went into, Almost all of the homes would all have a sandbag bunker outside of the house. Do you think about that a little bit about what would it be like to live in a war zone? And this kind of gives you reality. You walk in. The families need to have something very close to their house so they can quickly get in and protect themselves. So that's kind of the environment that these cap marines are going to be operating in. Uh, when you asked me about this topic, I asked um, the Facebook group, Cap Marine Association, hey, can any of you guys send me some pictures? And I was overwhelmed. So this is one of the pictures that one of the guys sent. Thank you, Rich Stroman. Yeah. So where is Vietnam? So I, I teach American history at two colleges in Southern California, Mount San Jacinto College and Moreno Valley College. And so this would be a screen that I would put up in front of my class. A lot of my students don't know where Vietnam is. Wow. Well, I didn't know Moreno Valley had a college. We used to live there. Yeah, it's part of Riverside City College. And there are three campuses. And I, of course, I think Moreno Valley is the best of the three, but. <laughs> okay, here's where Vietnam is in the Southeast section of the Asian landmass. And Vietnam had been a colony of France uh, prior to World War II. So I won't really get into a lot of that, but uh, France lost its bid to regain its colony in 1954 and what to do with Vietnam and the other French colonies went to um, a group of nations that met in Geneva, Switzerland. <clears throat> and in 1954, uh, the Geneva Accords sanctioned a um, partition of Vietnam, North and South, so communist North, non-communist South. But the communists continued to want to acquire the South and thus the Vietnam War and the United States eventually would send combat troops. This happens in 1965 and here you see some Marines from the 3rd Marine Division landing at Da Nang which is north central Vietnam on March the 8th 1965. Uh, two battalions from the 3rd Marine Division uh, will come ashore. Uh, I, I met a few of these guys during my time in the Marine Corps and they tell you about this landing. Here they are all ready to do combat. And what you don't see in the picture is up on the beach 
rather than soldiers opposing them were a bunch of young Vietnamese girls with flower lays to put over their necks. These guys were dumbfounded. Uh, they would uh, encounter combat soon enough. Now, <clears throat> Vietnam, as the American combat troops come into Vietnam, South Vietnam is broken up into four separate uh, tactical zones. And zone one is up in the northern part of South Vietnam. And we GIs refer to this as I Corps. So if you ever hear anything. Uh, yeah, they talk about that on MASH. Talk They're about the I Corps. Corps. This is yeah. it. Okay. Uh, MASH is Korea, and they no. have similar. Okay. But here's where I Corps was, and this is where the combat Marines were concentrated. Um, <clears throat> by 1968, there's going to be 82,000 combat Marines in South Vietnam. Um, kind of a small portion of the entire American force, there are going to be over 500,000 American combat troops in South Vietnam in 1968. And that's where the peak was. Repeat that. After Go ahead. Repeat that number you, you just said. Over 500,000 in 1968. Now that's an election year and Richard Nixon is going to win the election in 1968. And one of his promises was he would end the Vietnam War. So he started off by reducing the troop count. I wasn't born yet. 1968? Mm-hmm. Oh, yes I was. <laughs> I wasn't going to deny. Okay. I lie about my. I can neither confirm or deny. Right there we go. So the Cap Marine program actually starts in August of 1965, rather unofficially, and it starts with the Third Battalion, Fourth Marines, which was one of the regiments, one of the three infantry regiments of Third Marine Division. And they started up in the northern part of I Corps at a place called Fubai. So here it is right here. All right. This is uh, the badge that all Cap Marines were supposed to wear. Um, by the time I got there, the guys weren't wearing these all of the time. But here I still have mine. So you were a Cap Marine. Yes. Well, I saw where I you was. were on the map there. Yeah. English Combined Action Program and in Vietnamese, Luc Long Hong Hop. Exactly what those words translate to. I, I've heard a hundred different versions, but basically it means combined action force. Okay. Now, the Cap Marine Program operated from 1965 until 1971. And this is a very typical depiction of what Cap Marines are doing. Isn't it wonderful to be hiking through muddy, dirty water? Yeah. Did that the off the water? Yeah. Uh, Cap Marine platoon, uh, not a typical Marine platoon. Normally it would consist of about a 13-man Marine rifle squad and augmented by a Navy corpsman. So every cap platoon would have a Navy corpsman with them. And in reality, the number of Marines in a cap platoon would vary. I almost never saw one, 13 guys. And the reason that they would vary is due to casualties. Somebody would get hurt and be evacuated. You wouldn't get a replacement soon, quite often. Or somebody would rotate. Uh, you reach the end of your 13 month um, tour and you leave and you wouldn't get a replacement right away. But we used to complain about how much gear we had to carry in training back in the States. And little did I know that in the real thing, 
you end up oftentimes having to carry an awful lot more than you did in training because you'd lose guys for one reason or another, and you still had the same amount of equipment for the platoon that had to be carried around. And your food, your food was like in tins, and so you had... Uh, C rations, we called it. C stands for cans. Okay, <clears throat> augmenting the Marines would also be uh, Vietnamese. So I'm going to move these captions around so you can see all of this. Um, the squad or larger size group that augmented the Marines would be soldiers from the area that we were operating in. These were called Vietnamese popular forces, kind of like reserves, kind of like National Guard, except that these guys are part time. and They've got their own jobs during the day. Typically, they're farmers. In Vietnamese, that's pronounced Nia Quan. And here is a group of Nia Quans, along with one of the Marines that responded with pictures for me, John Farrington. Uh, the Marines would sometimes be augmented with regional defense forces also. It's, it's similar to popular forces. Um, here we go. There we go. And together with this augmented force, we would be cons uh, considered a combined action platoon. Okay, so that's where your cap comes from. Okay. All right, so here is another photograph of popular forces, Nia Kwans. All right. And most of these Neoquans were guys that could not be or would not be drafted into the regular Army of the Republic of Vietnam, ARVN. We called them Arvins. And the reason that these guys would not be um, drafted into the Arvins might be that they had some kind of medical problem or perhaps they were too old or in some cases, the guys had been Arvins, but had been wounded too many times and could not, could no longer serve with the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. We had a few guys like that. One guy in particular in our Neoquan platoon uh, was larger than all of the other uh, Neoquans. He was probably five foot eight, was towers above, above the other Vietnamese, and we called him Baby Huey. Baby Huey. He was an outstanding soldier. He'd been in Arvin and wounded many times. And whenever we went out on patrol with that guy, he always wanted to walk point. So, no, no, it's just my country. I'm going to do this. Love that guy. His name was Wa. H O A. Wa. Yeah, like W A. Okay. Now, as I'm told, the regional defense forces included women, but um, I never saw any men in any of the regional defense forces. Look at how long her nails are. Yeah. <laughs> we referred to the regional defense forces as the RD codes. C-O, co, it's the Vietnamese word for girl or miss or young lady and so when you address the vietnamese uh young woman you would refer to her as co so we used to call them the rd codes and typically they'd be armed with these m1 carbines cast offs from world war ii okay now the popular forces added some positive things to the cap platoon. They had a knowledge of the area. They knew the people. They knew the terrain. And uh, the people knew them. And typically, they might be related to the people in the area. They also brought the emotional benefit of uh, associated with defending their homes. 
And we brought the benefit to them of having trained combat Marines with them. So in most cases, that was quite a benefit to them as we were highly trained individuals. Most CAP Marines would go through Marine Corps infantry training, Marine Corps advanced um, infantry training, and then probably some other type of Marine Corps training before going to Vietnam. Uh, I went to Marine recon school after all of those infantry schools before I went to Vietnam. Uh, in some cases, the popular forces soldiers didn't particularly need uh, as much training as we brought to them because they had been Arvins and they were highly trained as well. But the fact that uh, you had these trained individuals with you when the chips were down uh, was an encouragement. So here you can see some cap marines and um, Neoquans in the field. That firearm looks heavy. This is an M60 machine gun. Fires a 7.62 millimeter bullet, which is the same bullet that is fired, oops, uh, uh, in the M14 rifle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, this next scene here is the original cap school. Uh, General Lou Walt, who had um, commanded all of the Marines uh, in Vietnam in 1967, he would eventually go on to be the assistant um, commandant of the Marine Corps. He formalized the CAP program and put Lieutenant w uh, Colonel William Corson as the head of the CAP Marines in 1967. Here we go. And what this picture is, the first CAP school that was in Da Nang, it was a near a place that you may have heard of called China Beach. Oh, there was a TV show called China Beach. Yeah. I watched it. Yeah. Okay. By the time I got there, the CAP school had moved uh, to Hoi An as I was in second CAG, and that was the only CAG unit left. 1970. The CAP school would be brief, 10 days, and uh, in CAP school you would learn Vietnamese phrases, Vietnamese customs, culture, some civic action precepts, and other military topics particular to Vietnam. Uh, to this day, I like to cross my legs when I sit, but if there's anybody sitting near me, I will not put my foot on top of my knee because it will point at somebody, and that is very oh. bad manners. Oh, okay, yeah, I can't show them the bottom of your foot. I just read that in a book. I was reading about a guy who went in the Marines. Yeah. In Vietnam, if you pointed the bottom of your foot, that meant you wished your evil spirits to go out of you into somebody else. So you didn't do that in polite company. Okay. Here is another depiction of I Corps, and at, at the height of combined action, which would be the early months of 1970, we had all four combined action groups uh, in operation. First CAG down here in the south, in Quang Nai and Quang Tin provinces. Uh, second CAG in Quang Nam, which is where I was. Third CAG. Tien, which is near uh, Da Nang. I'm sorry, Da Nang's second uh, way city. And then in the far north, Quang Tri for fourth CAG. All of those started to go away with the uh, Nixon uh, Vietnamization program. But at the height of the program in late 1969, we had 102 cap platoons, 19 companies, and these four groups. Kind of an interesting uh, setup for the Marine Corps in that these groups did not belong to any particular Marine division. They were part of something called the Third Marine Amphibious Force. Does amphibious mean that they, they came by boat? Well, technically that's what it means, but 
Nobody I knew came by boat. We all flew in on uh, airliners. And we called that the Freedom Bird. But they were commercial airliners that flew in and out of uh, Freedom Hill um, Air Base in Da Nang. Wow. I yeah. didn't know that. I just thought they all crammed in the back of a C-130 and got dropped off. Well, that's how I got there. I, I flew on a C-130 from uh, Okinawa to the Philippines and then over. I came with a load of plywood, me and three other guys. Uh, but when you fly out, you normally would fly out in a commercial airplane. And that's how I left. American Airlines. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Now, Cap Marines, like I said earlier, would actually live in the Vietnamese villages. So here's a photograph of a Marine walking through one of the villages. Notice all the kids. Yeah. Oh, wherever we went, the kids always found us. We had goodies. They wanted the goodies. The Marine Corps used to send out normally once a month, sometimes more often that, something we called SPs, sundry supplies. So you'd get razors and soap and uh, cigarettes and candy bars, Hershey's tropical style chocolate bars. None of the guys liked the tropical style Hershey bars. We hated them. They tasted terrible, but the kids loved them. So we were always giving these chocolate bars away. What made them different, tropical? Well, I don't know exactly, but I used to say, instead of putting sugar in it, they used salt. Oh, okay. But the, the Vietnamese love salt. Okay, a typical cap marine. The cap uh, combined action platoons would move every day so that the enemy would not have a preconception of where we were going to be every, any particular night. So when it got dark, um, in my first platoon, we would all go out and surround the village. We protected a refugee village on a place called Ganoi Island. My second platoon, we were in a different kind of setup, and we actually were out in an area called Dinbon District, and we would move out every night to a separate Vietnamese home. And then every morning on the first platoon, we'd come back to a different Vietnamese home. Um, but in the second platoon I was in, we'd be at that home that we went to that night and stay there all day. So where did you, you sleep? Like in their home, but like their home like that <laughs> On the, just on the Where did I sleep? Oh, that's an excellent question. The first night that I went out, uh, my buddy that uh, I paired up with, a guy named Bob Nation, who lives in uh, Illinois today, he was the tallest guy in our platoon, six foot three. So, of course, we called him Tiny. <laughs> and so first night that I went out, Tiny tells me, I'll take the first watch. You go ahead and go to sleep. Now, this was monsoon season, rain everywhere, mud everywhere. Oh, go to sleep? Where do I go to sleep? I took my flak jacket off. This is my flak jacket. I put it on the ground, and I curled up on top of it. That's where I slept. The Marine Corps gave everybody a poncho liner, which is a waterproof blanket. That's where you sleep. Prisoners today in penitentiaries in the United States sleep better than Marines do in combat. Yep. Eventually, I would find out from the other guys how to, where to purchase a hammock. So most of the guys had hammocks that they'd hang in these houses. And that's where I slept. And one time I got to go on a, um, a work party. I got a one night R&R back at third company headquarters and as I was helping to clean up the compound I found a closet that had air mattresses in it and I thought well we're out there sleeping in the mud and you've got air mattresses 
I stuffed several of them in my backpack. Uh, what we call midnight requisition. <laughs> when I got back to the platoon, I handed a few out. And so for the rest of my tour, I was able to sleep on an air mattress. Uh, in a cap platoon, we sent out a platoon, uh, a patrol every day. So typically there would be three Marines and perhaps four, five, or six Neoquans that would go out on the patrol. So you could tell if a cap platoon had 10 Marines, you're going to go out on patrol every third day. And so that's what we did. Now, Due to President Nixon's promise to reduce the American uh, participation in the Vietnam War, he started to reduce American troop numbers in 1969. That was continuing to go on. 1970, when I got there, and by 1971, there's only one CAG unit left, Second Combined Action Group, which uh, was based in Hoi An, Vietnam. Here is a photograph of one of the last combined action platoons. This happens to be um, combined action platoon number 232. Two being second CAG, three being third platoon, and uh, I'm sorry, third company, and two being platoon number two. And I recognize these guys. They were serving at the time that I was. You might know this guy right here. Who is he? Greg Evans. Greg Evans. Greg he Evans, one teenager. of my best friends when I was a teenager. Uh, he lives in Georgia today. I I don't remember him personally. I just remember stories about him. I think you guys snuck him into the movies one time. He was in the trunk and the, you said, yeah, two. And he and Nancy heard him in the trunk. Uh, said, yeah, three. Well, that was Clayton, but uh, oh, okay. we, we've got even funnier stories about Greg. If Casey watches this, I'm going to skip those stories. Uh, oh, I was All right. I just remember stories. Okay. Um, with the Marines being moved, some of the villages that we had been protecting uh, would come under attack. And one particular village, which was not too far from my original platoon on Ganoi Island, um, a village called Duck Duck, where the people had been very friendly to Marines, and they also had some Army Green Beret near their area. And so it was very well known that these people were friendly to Americans, and they got attacked by North Vietnamese troops. Now, we called them the NVA, North Vietnamese Army but their official name was the People's Army of Vietnam, or PAVN, Pavan. On March 29, 1971, with the Marines gone, the NVA struck Duck Duck, and this is what it looked like the next day. So, were we effective while we were there? I guess you could say yes. The people were alive while we were there. And Duck Duck was defended by the 412th Regional Force, 123rd Popular Forces, and those uh, Army Green Berets that I told you about. The Green Beret had a compound near Duck Duck. And I had been to that compound uh, as a young Marine. We had gone over there at one time to help them out with a special project. And those Green Beret Army sergeants, they loved us. 19, 20 year old PFCs and, and Lance Corporal Marines. And we called everybody Sar Staff Sergeant and above to a Marine. That's a sir. And these Green Beret sergeants just loved it. We called them all sir. <laughs> they thought that was so funny. You don't do that in the Army. You say sergeant, but. We respected them, and, and they liked us back. Here are the results of Duck Duck battle. 20 Neoquans dead, 26 Neoquans wounded, 
103 South Vietnamese civilians killed. 96 South Vietnamese uh, civilians injured and 37 of them kidnapped. We don't know what happened to them. Hmm. And this was the 38th Regiment of the North Vietnamese Army. So here's what they look like on parade. Uh, everybody's heard of My Lai. A very, very terrible, dastardly thing that was done by some U.S. Army soldiers. I have to admit that was wretched what happened in My Lai. But just as wretched was Duck Duck, and nobody's ever heard of Duck Duck. This did not make it into the news. But My Lai, of course, did. Well, with the Vietnamese program, uh, Nixon program going into effect, the Marine Corps was reducing the number of Marines. And by the end of 1971, all combat Marines are going to be out of Vietnam, including 2nd CAG. On May the 11th, 1971, there would be an official program uh, turning over and closing the Marine uh, Second CAG compound in Hoi An. So here is a photograph of it. One of the guys sent this. Thank you very much. Uh, I remember being in CAP school here at Second CAG headquarters. I had uh, duty, uh, con excuse me, um, guard duty one evening, very early in the morning in this compound uh, checkpoint down here on the corner. I could look out on this river and see the Vietnamese out there uh, fishing. They're pretty interesting. And here's the uh, sign that was out in front. And by May 17th, 1971, this compound was turned over by the Cap Marines that were still there over to the South Vietnamese Army. Uh, I was not there on May 17th. I was in Okinawa at that point. I was with the last group that got pulled out of the field. I never knew that. And today there is a CAP Vet Association, and they have a reunion every year on November the 11th, actually on November 10th. Him, the Marine Corps' birthday. Yes. yes. Oh, that was a terrible mistake that I made right there. November the 10th, every year there is a reunion. And I, I've only been one time. I mentioned my buddy Bob Nation. He found me somehow online a few years ago and wrote to me, and I wrote him back, and we exchanged phone numbers, and he called me. And he said, Lee, the reunion is in San Diego this year. You have no excuse. you got to go. So I went. And it was just a delight to see Bob again. And he still towers over all the other guys. Six three. Uh, oh, tiny. Was that? Yeah, we called him Tiny. Oh, it was, it was funny. Even his wife calls him that now. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> uh, Bob is now a retired mailman, and he lives in uh, rural Illinois. Uh, here is their announcement from one of the reunions. Not sure if they're going to have one this year because of COVID. It might get canceled. When was that reunion in, in uh, San Diego? That happened in, uh, I think it was 2015. So not too long ago. No, not too long ago. I, I asked because when I was a teenager, I somehow ended up with a belt from your house that said Wilkerson on it. And I used to wear it. Oh. I this belt and I had it and then when I was um, in my 20s I gave it back to you and then you, you saw Wilkerson again and gave him this belt <laughs> um, thanks for the loan John, yeah John D. Wilkerson he lives in Texas now um, 
the last time I talked to John, um, it's been a few years ago. We did it through the email. And John confessed to me that after he got out of the Marine Corps, this is going to make you cry. He joined the Army. <gasps> I'm, I'm shocked. I'm beyond tears. I'm just shocked. Yeah. Then he retired from the Army. I'm sorry I gave you your belt back. Oh, I said, John. <laughs> We never called him John anyway. We called him Wilkie. Wilkie. Yeah. He was in um, 2nd CAG, 7th Company. Dog face. Mm. John P. Wilkerson. Yeah. We were great buddies. We got in an awful lot of trouble at Camp Pendleton after Vietnam. But uh, another one of those stories I'm, <laughs> I'm yeah, I don't know anything. Sure. Okay. Yeah. We had a good group of guys. Okay. Uh, let me uh, bring you back. I'm going to unshare the screen. Now just open for questions. Uh, well, I, I had on my notes about Wilkers Wilkerson's belt. I'm going to reach off screen to show you this book. Um, I don't know. It just caught my eye. I bought it to have something to read on the beach this week. It's a hillbilly book, but he joins the Marines and he talks about how every Marine is deathly afraid of <laughs> yellow footprints. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know what? Uh, well, okay. Let me explain what that is. When you first go to boot camp, you go on a bus and uh, when the bus stops at MCRD, whether it's in Paris Island or in San Diego, it's still called MCRD, Marine Corps Recruit Depot. Okay. And your first introduction to the Marine Corps is a drill instructor that gets off into the bus and now starts screaming at you. And you will not be um, communicated with by other than screaming for the next three months. And he starts calling you every name in the book. Get the blank, blank off the blank, blank bus. Stand in the yellow feet prints. So right outside the bus, there is painted on the blacktop feet prints like this. Like that. So that you automatically are standing at attention. Now, last year, as you know, I tried to go visit my sons in the Air Force. We went to Virginia last year and having to go through TSA at the airport, <laughs> they printed yellow feet print for you to stand on while they scan you. And so the guy said, stand on the yellow footprint, feet, footprints. And I said, oh, my God, do you know what that means to a Marine? And the guy had happened to have been a Marine and he just started laughing. So he says, oh, Marine, huh? I go, yeah. yeah. He says, well, you got to do it. So, yes. Yeah, um, and this, uh, in this book, in the chapter on where he talked about the Marines, you know, he was hillbilly. He didn't know how to balance a checkbook. He didn't know that banks had, had different um, percentages. or um, I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, financing. They had different ways to finance. He didn't know that. Uh, uh, there was just so much that he learned just from being a Marine and that I, I didn't know before either. So, I don't know. It was pretty good. I was laughing because the way his mom, his grandma talked <laughs> a, lot oh. like, a lot like that drill sergeant. <laughs> um, MCRD, I had a question about that and I can't remember now. Um, but as you know, I'm, I am, I'm running for re-election, so I've been doing a lot of campaigning and knocking on doors and I met a Marine this weekend uh it, yeah he had a marine hat on he said he ran the marine corps marathon 19 times wow and and that's on my bucket list i really really want to run the marine corps marathon um but they're not going to have it this year except virtual but uh he said it, it's really worth it it's one of the best marathons out there I, and i know the marines hand you your water and it ends at iwo jima the the monument oh oh at uh, um, um arlington, arlington. Yeah. yeah it's kind of off to the side. Um, yep, the side. I, I've been there. So yeah, I have too. And uh, the last time I was in DC, uh, my friend of mine that went with me, we, we got an award for, for work on a, a bill we did. And uh, the taxi driver had never, had never seen it. So he drove us around it three times and then he parked that he stopped the car so we could take pictures. So I was glad that he, he got to see that. And, and my friend too, Victoria. Um, 
And then the, the last thing I had on my list of notes is um, the term Indochina. So Indochina refers to, I guess, okay. all those countries. Southeast Asia uh, had been part of the French Empire. Not that they wanted to be, but the French wanted them to be. And so uh, what used to be called French Indochina is today the countries of Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia. Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia? Cambodia, right. But not Thailand. No, Thailand, uh, independent, Siam. Yes, Siam. Um, Thailand was occupied by the Japanese during World War II, but they were officially supposed to be neutral. And they've always been um, independent. Europeans never took over Thailand. Um, to the west of Thailand is Myanmar, which used to be called Burma, and that was part of the British Empire, but not Thailand. Okay. I, I've also been to Thailand, by the way, uh, Bangkok, and uh, another city in the very far south called uh, Alistar. Um, I spent a lot of time in Malaysia. Right, and I've never heard of Malaysia. When you first went there, I'm like, where? Where is he? Uh, oh, I love Malaysia. Malaysia used to be called Malaya. It's on the Malay Peninsula, and it was part of the British Empire. And if you visit Malaysia, most people there speak English, but you'll notice that they speak a British-type English. Really? That's interesting. Yeah. Can you give an example? Yeah, uh, we say, oh, we get along really good. They would say, oh, we get on quite well. Or <laughs> get on instead, quite of a, well. instead of a cell phone, they'll call it a, a mobile phone. And if you want somebody to get something done right away, they'd say, oh, we'll get this done straight away. Very British. They drive on the wrong side of the street, too. The wrong side of the street, yeah. too. Uh, Same with you, Singapore. You know, at the beginning of the show in the intro, I talked about how this show has been on the air since 2006. So in some of the early earlier episodes, like 2007, there twice I went to the library to look up some old newspaper articles. One was for a murder that, uh, or a little homicide that took place in 1971 or 73. I think it was 73. And the other was uh, about uh, POWs, MIAs, because... Uh, I did a book review for a magazine on um, a book um, about the issue. And in it, there was an exclusive, they mentioned an exclusive to the New Hampshire Sunday News, which is, you know, the union leader is what we, we call it now. Um, they, they had two editions back in the 70s. And in this exclusive, this mother traveled to Southeast Asia to look for her son who never came home. Anyway, I, I was curious if it piqued my interest. I went to the library and I went through all this and then looking at these, you know, ads for dungarees and there was all talk of the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War was still going on when I was, it was, it was just interesting to see that in, in the paper because they didn't totally pull out until 1975. So. Well, the United States combat troops were all pulled out March 1973. We still had uh, American military personnel there, but not combat troops. Oh, okay. So that ends at the end of April 1975 with the communist conquest of South Vietnam and uh, the Vietnam North Vietnamese Army will uh, take over Saigon in April 30th, 1975. And those would be the, the photographs and the videos that you see of the Americans leaving the roof of the American um, embassy. Uh, embassy in Saigon, 1975. You know, the, uh, turntables are, are back on the market, but they don't have record stores like they used to. But my, my youngest and I have been going to antique stores and, and thrift shops to look for albums. And I just bought him uh, this, the album with the song still in Saigon. And I, and I have it on my playlist on my phone, too. Da, who sings it? Um, my mind went blank. It's, is, is it Dire Straits? Did they sing? That's not right, is it? I, I do not know. Yeah. Saigon was renamed Ho Chi Minh City. Oh, that's right. Uh, and, and 
I'm going to look it up. But Time's up. <laughs> yeah, and well, that's what I had. I had 45 minutes just because I have another show this afternoon. So I've got a, a, that I am taping in the studio. It'll be my first time taping in the studio since before quarantine. So we missed our birthday this year. Um, we all have the same birthday. The, the station manager and, and Justin, who, who's doing the producing of the, well, he, he's well. Control. Today, today is my daughter Michelle's birthday. I know, happy birthday, Michelle! And I know that we have so many family birthdays in the summer. I cannot keep track of them. Oh, I, there was one more more thing I wanted to mention because because I was really little when you you went to Vietnam, so I don't even remember you ever being at home before <laughs> before Vietnam. Uh, but there was a cassette tape that I found, I guess, in the eighties, and I played it. It was a cassette that you made, a recording that you made in Vietnam. And you had mentioned that because um, it, it was my birthday and then and Mary and Jimmy, we all had our birthdays together. We're all a year and a day apart. And you had mentioned that our birthdays were coming up. Oh. So their birthdays and, and Justin and, and Nick and Nick LaValle, who runs the station, um, we always have celebrate our birthdays and we didn't do that this year. So if I have time, I'm going to stop and get some cupcakes on the way. Oh, very nice. <laughs> I wish you could have some too. I think I have that tape now. Do you? Yeah, wow. Ma, our mom saved that, and uh, she gave me a shoebox full of letters too. I've not read them, but I've got those two. Yeah, and yeah. I think I she had your dog tags. I remember seeing those. Remember, it, you know how oh, every family. I, I still have that. Yeah, every, hanging on the wall. In a tin box that's full of junk, <laughs> and it was in there. Yeah. Go ahead, you can get you, it. You can't see it, but it's hanging on the bottom of the spoon rack. Along with a can opener. I remember the can opener too. That was in the tin. Yeah. Cookie yeah. tin. Now you open it up and think there's cookies in it and there's not. It's just a bunch of things. But that, oh, yeah. that was in there. I remember. Seed rations. Yeah. 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 We helped the Marine Corps with their inventory of sea rations. We helped to reduce that for them. I remember opening up cases of sea rations in Vietnam in 1970, marked. 1945. Oh my gosh. Wow. You know, I, um, I Can't food a, lasts a long time. I wrote a memorial for uh, a first sergeant in uh, World War II. His name was Colonel Kingsbury. He was a state rep one term. He used to sit in front of me. So when he died, I, I, I wrote something for him and I have his memoir somewhere and there's only one picture in the book and it's, it was, it was I'm in it. He, that's the picture that he chose was that time he got to be on chat and pitch need. So you, oh, you're big time being on the show, <laughs> but um, he talked about the, the D rations and how awful they were in those bars. They're, they were so tough and they, they couldn't heat anything up because they couldn't have a fire. Everything was frozen. It was. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, Korea, everything frozen. But yeah, they made us eat a lot of C rations in training without cooking them. So you got to get used to this because sometimes you can't start a fire. Well, I never uh, had that problem in Vietnam. I was always able to start a fire. Uh, what I did notice is that the heat tabs that they give you, kind of like Sterno, uh, weren't strong enough to heat the food up very well. I so a lot of guys used this probably a big no-no, but we cut little pieces of C4 explosive uh. And we'd light that on fire, and that made a real hot fire. Oh, I bet that heated your food. Oh, you could boil a canteen cup full of water with, with C4. Yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend it. Luckily, nobody ever got blown up. <laughs> you know, it's funny because we come from a big Marine family with you and Dad and Uncle Harry and our cousin Moose <laughs> and yeah. the, the nephew. Brother in law Dan, right? Oh, yeah, Dan. I'm sorry, Dan. Um, yeah, you were all Marines, and then, but our boys are Air Force. But, but even in the Air Force, you know, they go through some training. And my son, Patrick, he, he was so hungry. He didn't take the time to heat up anything. He just, oh, it's a bag now. Open the oh, bag yeah. and scarf it down. So, right. um, so. We, we got to be pretty good sea ration chefs after a while. Uh, you'd know how to mix certain things to make it taste better. Uh, for instance, if you had the hickory flavored cheese, you could put that in the can of pork and beans and, and hot dogs, stir that around, that make that taste better. If you found the two chows, one had a, a, a pound cake and another one had peaches, you could mix the peaches and the pound cake together. Oh. 
so the pound cake wouldn't be so dry and it actually tastes pretty good that way you know you guys that are watching this show you could get together and, and make a recipe yeah. because i've got a book of uh like rosie the riveter recipes from World there, War. there were some chows that you just could not approve no matter what something we called ham and mothers yeah <laughs> i can guess what that means <laughs> yeah uh and let's see ham with lima beans that was terrible oh that sounds bad uh something we also called ham and mothers was uh ham and egg roll it's just like a like scrambled eggs all compacted it was terrible you, yeah. you could not improve that either now when uh, our sister lynn went in the army uh, they still had things in cans but i remember her, she brought home some some rations and there was a yeah candy today was, they have what did they call it uh, mres yes and it's similar to what we used to call lerps long range patrol rations oh. and it'd be a big pouch with dehydrated something in it and you'd pour in boiling hot water which again you couldn't boil unless you did it with c4 the heat tab wouldn't do it. But anyway, you pour in the boiling hot water and then you'd mix it up. You'd get beef and rice or chicken and rice or something like that. And those were pretty good. Once in a great while, we'd get those and all the guys loved that. Mm -hmm. And they have foods like that for hikers. Yes. I know a lot yes. of the hikers, they get these foods. I'm like, oh, that looks like an MRE. <laughs> Only it's packaged a little nicer. Yeah. yeah. Well, we didn't get the MREs that they have today, but we had these LERPs, which was just the big pouch. I was getting a text. I was making sure it wasn't the studio because I lose track of time. Oh, they <laughs> tell you you have to shut up now? I'm sorry. No, it's from my boss, actually. Oh, I see. <laughs> from okay. my boss. The governor's going to be in town on uh, this week, so we're just okay. setting up something there. But anyway, this is this has been awesome. Thank you for uh, for being my guest on my first virtual special show. Great. Well, thank you for having me. And I'm really looking forward to being able to put this up on the Cap Marine Association uh, site on Facebook. Uh, a lot of these guys were just really excited to hear that we were doing this. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. And uh, a lot of them sent me some photographs. Which I was just overwhelmed. So this is great. I love those guys. And um, they did one heck of a service for their country. Yes, they uh, did. I, I showed you those guys walking through all of that water. Mm -hmm. Very, very typical, very typical day for our cat marines. Well, thank you guys. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Lee and the cat marines. And I'm going to end this show by saying to all of you, welcome home. Thank you very much. <laughs>